issues related to the fairness of our city and neighborhoods. The city is creating an equitable development data tool to inform those conversations and help us plan for a fairer city. This data tool will be an online interactive resource for New Yorkers who are interested in exploring the city's housing conditions, demographic patterns, public health, and more. The city will formally launch the tool in April 2022, and your feedback in the upcoming weeks can help us shape it. Mockups that allow you to simulate navigating the upcoming tool are available for you to explore. Let's take a look. You'll first see a map of New York City. You can select the area you'd like to explore data for, a neighborhood, a borough, or the whole city. For example, let's select the Sunnyside and Woodside area in Queens, then view data. You'll see key data categories on the left and tables on the right, giving you easy access to information that can facilitate conversations about equity in the city. We can use this data to better understand factors that may contribute to displacement or the involuntary movement of a person or family from their home and support strategies to help New Yorkers stay in their homes and neighborhoods. One component of the data tool will be a displacement risk index map. This map will illustrate the level of risk that residents of a neighborhood may face of being displaced as compared to other neighborhoods. Select the neighborhood to see a summary of data that is relevant to displacement risk. For example, poverty level, housing conditions, and rent change. The displacement risk index will be a snapshot of current conditions. It isn't a tool for predicting changes in a neighborhood or outcomes of any given proposal. We expect a wide variety of New Yorkers will use the data tool, such as advocacy groups, community boards, elected officials, and policymakers. Share your ideas about how this in-development resource can be shaped and improved to help advance collective discussions around racial equity and access to affordable and quality housing. Give your feedback online, by email, or at upcoming public information sessions and hearings. Get all the details and learn more about the data tool at bit.ly slash equitable data tool. The City of New York is committed to promoting fair housing and equitable development throughout the five boroughs. Part of that commitment is better equipping New Yorkers with information to facilitate challenging conversations about housing affordability, racial equity, displacement, and other issues related to the fairness of our city and neighborhoods. The city is creating an equitable development data tool to inform those conversations and help us plan for a fairer city. This data tool will be an online interactive resource for New Yorkers who are interested in exploring the city's housing conditions, demographic patterns, public health, and more. The city will formally launch the tool in April 2022, and your feedback in the upcoming weeks can help us shape it. Mockups that allow you to simulate navigating the upcoming tool are available for you to explore. Let's take a look. You'll first see a map of New York City. You can select the area you'd like to explore data for, a neighborhood, a borough, or the whole city. For example, let's select the Sunnyside and Woodside area in Queens, then view data. You'll see key data categories on the left and tables on the right, giving you easy access to information that can facilitate conversations about equity in the city. 
We can use this data to better understand factors that may contribute to displacement or the involuntary movement of a person or family from their home and support strategies to help New Yorkers stay in their homes and neighborhoods. One component of the data tool will be a displacement risk index map. This map will illustrate the level of risk that residents of a neighborhood may face of being displaced as compared to other neighborhoods. Select the neighborhood to see a summary of data that is relevant to displacement risk. For example, poverty levels, housing conditions, and rent change. The Displacement Risk Index will be a snapshot of current conditions. It isn't a tool for predicting changes in a neighborhood or outcomes of any given proposal. We expect a wide variety of New Yorkers will use the data tool, such as advocacy groups, community boards, elected officials, and policymakers. Share your ideas about how this in-development resource can be shaped and improved to help advance collective discussions around racial equity and access to affordable and quality housing. Give your feedback online, by email, or at upcoming public information sessions and hearings. Get all the details and learn more about the data tool at bit.ly slash equitable data tool. Good afternoon. My name is Ahmed Tagani, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for Neighborhood Strategies at the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. I am delighted to kick off today's public hearing on the city's ongoing implementation of Local Law 78. I am joined today by my colleagues from the Department of City Planning. Our two agencies are working jointly to develop, build, and maintain this important tool. From the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, I am joined by Michael Sandler, the Assistant Commissioner for Neighborhood Development and Stabilization, and Renee Woodson from the Neighborhood Planning Unit. From the Department of City Planning, I am joined by Lara Marita, the, the Director of Neighborhood Studies, and Howard Slatkin, the Deputy Executive Director for Strategic Planning, and Sarit Platkin from the Queen's Office. Local Law 78 was born out of advocacy and leadership by the Racial Impact Study Coalition and the public advocate Jamani Williams' office and calls for the creation of an equitable development data tool. This data tool empowers New Yorkers with critical information about the state of housing, development, and racial equity in our city. Since the law passed nine months ago, City staff have dedicated themselves to the creation of this data tool and the associated citywide displacement risk index. Our commitment to this effort is strengthened by our belief in its goal. The interagency team sees this new tool as a shared resource between planners and communities, one that can help us through hard conversations about displacement pressures and neighborhood change. And the tool will support our ongoing development of strategies and policies that tackle the persistent racial disparities that undermine our communities. We are at a critical stage in our development of the Equitable Development Data Tool, and we want to hear from you. In January, we released draft materials for public review in anticipation of our mandated April 1 launch of the new web tool. Today, we will hear public testimony. If you aren't ready or able to share your perspective today, we would still love to hear from you. We encourage you to submit written testimony before March 20th or reach out to the project team. We will share our contact information at the end of the presentation. I just want to thank you again for joining us, for engaging with this initiative and with your communities and also your commitment to these ideals. We look forward to hearing from you. Before we open the floor for public comment, the project team will provide a brief presentation on the draft components of the initiative that have been available for review thus far. Good 
Next slide, please. Welcome. Hello, I am Sarit Platkin from the New York City Department of City Planning. Uh, before we start, I have a few housekeeping notes. We will start with the presentation and then dedicate the rest of the meeting to hearing testimony. Once the presentation is over, I will instruct you to raise your hand if you wish to provide testimony during today's public hearing. Speakers will provide testimony in the order that they raise their hand. I will go over these instructions again in more detail after the presentation is over. Next slide, please. In addition, if you are having any technical difficulties, call the hotline number on the screen. The number is 877-853-5247 and enter meeting ID 618-237-7396. The password is one pound and someone will be there to assist you. The technical hotline info can be found at the bottom of every slide in case you need assistance. There will be American Sign Language interpretation throughout the presentation of the public hearing. In addition to ASL, we are offering simultaneous interpretation today in Spanish, Mandarin, and Cantonese. To access these languages, click the interpretation button on the bottom of the screen. Select the Spanish channel for Spanish, the Chinese channel for Mandarin, and the Portuguese channel for Cantonese. I'll pause here for the interpreters to provide these instructions in their respective languages. The Spanish consecutive translator, um, please translate the instructions. Thank you. Sí, muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes. Eh, nosotros estamos eh, en esta conferencia y si usted habla español, usted puede acceder al canal de habla hispana eh, dándole clic y entrando a uno de esos canales donde dice español. Spanish interpretation o interpretación en español. Muchas gracias. Hihao,我们现在开始我们这个听证会。那上面,屏幕上你所看到的是提供,如果你需要协助的话,你可以打上面的这个电话,1877-8532477,或者如果你有需要进入这个会议的话,它的IV是61877. 那它的密码是按一个一在一个井字键那如果你需要语言的服务中文的话请按呃那如果你需要广东话请按谢谢 Cantonese consecutive translator, please translate the instructions. Thank you. 欢迎你来,今日的公开听证会,如果你有问题,去听我们的频道,请你打电话去877-853-5247,那你就加上我们的开会的ID是61837-3965。我们的password是叫做你吃一次就可以了 Great, thank you so much. Next slide, please. So as Ahmed mentioned, we are just a few weeks away from our April 1st launch of the fully functional new data tool, and we look forward to your feedback and comments. In this draft phase, we want to make sure that we are hearing from a broad range of New Yorkers about how you would want to use this tool, how it relates to the conversations you're having in your communities, and whether the tool as it is currently designed would meet your needs. 
To spread the word and solicit input about this draft tool, we held a series of public information sessions and office hours in early March. Are holding the public hearing today and will continue to accept written testimony and feedback through March 20th. I also want to highlight that this is just the beginning of opportunities to learn about and weigh in on the tool. In addition to the upcoming, in addition to the public hearing today, we will be providing trainings for community boards and the public once the website is launched in April. We also look forward to ongoing conversations and feedback about the tool after the April launch. And the tool will continue to evolve after the launch as we see how it's being used in practice and how it can be improved. So with that, we look forward to sharing this draft resource with you today and hearing your testimony afterwards. Next slide, please. So what is the Equitable Development Data Tool? Next slide, please. The Equitable Development Data Tool is going to be an interactive online public data tool that will allow New Yorkers to explore data about housing conditions, demographics, quality of life, and more at the neighborhood, borough, and citywide levels. This new resource will provide New Yorkers with easy access to a wide range of data about their neighborhoods and city to help facilitate challenging conversations about housing affordability, racial equity, displacement, and other key planning issues. Whenever possible, these data will be broken down by neighborhood and race and ethnicity so that New Yorkers can learn about the disparities across neighborhoods and demographic groups. The data will also show change over time over the last 20 years, so New Yorkers can understand the shifting demographic and housing patterns in New York City. Next slide, please. So how did the tool originate? The creation of the Equitable Development Data Tool is a requirement of Local Law 78 passed in June of 2021. This legislation developed out of ongoing advocacy by the Racial Impact Study Coalition and public advocate Jamani Williams to ensure that racial equity is centered in major decisions affecting New York City neighborhoods, such as land use. Local Law 78 of 2021 includes two major components, the Equitable Development Data Tool and Racial Equity Reports. The Equitable Development Data Tool, as mentioned up front, will be an interactive web tool that will have a wide variety of data broken down by race and ethnicity available at the neighborhood up through the citywide scale. A key piece of the tool, as required by the legislation, is a Displacement Risk Index. The Displacement Risk Index is going to be a map of the city that illustrates the level of risk in different neighborhoods that residents face of being displaced or unable to remain in their homes or neighborhoods. The Equitable Development Data Tool is required to be complete by April 1st, and we are currently in the draft phase of the tool with the opportunity to provide input on it through March 20th. The second major component of the legislation, the Racial Equity Reports on Housing and Opportunity, will be disclosure reports required for certain land use applications beginning in June 2022. These reports will inform the land use process by providing context to support discussions of race and equity in planning. Next slide, please. Now that we've talked about what is required by the legislation, I wanna talk about the benefits we see this tool providing in practice. Having a tool that provides easily accessible neighborhood demographic and housing data broken down by race will bring racial equity considerations into the forefront of planning conversations in New York City. Given the potential for this new resource to inform everything from site-specific to neighborhood-wide to citywide planning efforts, we anticipate this tool could be used by a wide variety of stakeholders. Community boards may use it in reviewing land use proposals and preparing district need statements. Advocacy and nonprofit organizations may use it to do research about citywide housing and demographic trends. And community members leading conversations about neighborhood planning and change may use this data to help advocate for their planning priorities. Above all, as an interagency team, we see this new tool as becoming a shared resource between planners and community members that can provide a new way of talking and engaging about displacement pressures and neighborhood change that will hopefully allow for more common ground and facilitate planning policies that more explicitly consider race. Taken together, these objectives aim to support more equitable development long-term. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now that we've covered the background, we're going to show you the draft materials that are available for public review right now. Four major pieces of the tool are up for review during this draft phase. The first are interactive mock-ups of what the data tool will look like. 
The second is the displacement risk index or map of the city, illustrating the level of displacement risk in different neighborhoods as compared to each other. The third, or from there, we have supplemental materials, including a data dictionary uh, describing the data points and methodologies that will be included in the data tool and a bibliography of literature that informed the selected data points and methodologies. Next slide, please. The first major component for review right now is the interactive mock-up of the data tool. I'm going to demonstrate how one can navigate through the future data tool. This is the landing page for the future data tool, where you'll have the option of selecting between three levels of geography, community district, borough, and city. To get an example of what the data tables will look like, you'll be able to click on a neighborhood and then the view data button. Sunnyside and Woodside is the only clickable neighborhood in this mock-up, so we will use that as an example. Next slide, please. Before diving into the data tables, I will just note that these are just mock-ups to provide a sense of what the tool will look and feel like, which is why they aren't populated with actual data yet. That will be addressed in time for the tool to launch in April. On the data table, you will be able to toggle between the data tools six data categories on the left, demographics, household economic security, housing security, affordability and quality, housing production, quality of life and access to opportunity, and the displacement risk index. Starting by looking at the demographics category, the first data point is mutually exclusive race and Hispanic origin. You'll be able to scroll down to see the different data points, such as age and foreign born population, or scroll to the right to see how the indicators change over time from 2000 to 2020. These data points are all required by the legislation. You will also be able to see the data source at the top of the table. At the top navigation bar, you can see that all the data points will be available broken down by race and ethnicity, a key required component of the data tool. Next slide, please. Viewing the race ethnicity breakdowns will be possible for all categories, including housing production seen here, which shows change of housing units over time with information about affordable housing construction and preservation across the city. I'll also note that the download button in the top right will allow anyone interested in, anyone interested in the data to download the data tables. Another feature of note is the data reliability button on the top right that will allow users to see more detailed information about data reliability, including the margin of error and coefficient of variation for the data. I will also note that an important use of the data tool will be to provide data for the racial equity reports that will be required for certain land use applications. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Local Law 78 requires certain applicants participating in the city's land use review process, known as ULERP, to submit racial equity reports beginning in June 2022. These reports will provide context for the discussion of racial equity in the review of land use applications. The reports will generally be required for projects including residential development over 50,000 square feet or 50 units and non-residential development over 200,000 square feet, as well as other more specific cases. The racial equity reports will have three main components, a community profile of data pulled from the data tool, data about the project's proposed housing units and anticipated jobs, and a narrative statement of how the project relates to the city's goals to further fair housing and equitable access to opportunity. The interagency team advancing this project will move into developing guidance for the report as a next step and we'll be offering trainings to stakeholders about what will be included in the reports and how to review them in the spring. At this point, I will turn it over to Renee Wittison from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you, Sarit. We can go to the next slide. In addition to the data tables Sarit just walked us through, the data tool will include a displacement risk index. Next slide. Next slide. The displacement risk index is a composite indicator, which means it incorporates many factors that contribute to the inability to stay in one's home or neighborhood. 
The information we use to create this index reflects the most recent conditions and trends for which we have data. Next slide. As a component of the larger data tool, the displacement risk index will be public and anyone can use it to better understand differences and disparities across New York City neighborhoods. The displacement risk index will also be used to inform the development of strategies to prevent displacement, and it will provide context for the consideration of policies and projects. While the index can't predict outcomes from specific neighborhood or development proposals, it can provide important common ground for conversations about equity, housing, and neighborhood stability. Next slide. As I mentioned, the displacement risk index incorporates a number of risk factors. There are three major categories of factors that contribute to risk of displacement. Population vulnerability to displacement is one such category. These are characteristics of a household that make them more or less at risk of being forced to move, like how much of one's income they spend on rent. The second category of risk factors are housing conditions or characteristics of the housing itself that contribute to housing instability, like whether or not your rent is stabilized. And market pressure or neighborhood forces that can make it harder for a household to stay in their home. An example of this is increasing prices in the local housing market. I'll walk you through some maps showing how these three categories of risk factors vary across the city. And I'll note that all of the maps that you're about to see are available on the draft website right now for your review. Next slide. So this is back on the website Sarit was walking us through earlier. On the left, you can see the details of the map we're looking at. We're looking at the population vulnerability map which is composed of four data points, race, income, limited English proficiency, and rent burden. On the right is the map showing the degree of population vulnerability across the city. The darker blue areas represent more population-based risk factors relative to the rest of the city. The lighter colored areas show less intense risk factors relative to other neighborhoods. We picked these four indicators, uh, race, income, et cetera, because both research and experience show that these factors influence a household's housing stability. Next slide. The second category of risk factors is housing conditions. Again, these are combined characteristics of a neighborhood's housing rather than its households. The four housing condition data points are rental units, housing that is not income restricted or rent stabilized, and housing that has a lot of maintenance deficiencies. We include these factors because again, research and experience show that they impact displacement risk. Rental housing, for example, is considered less stable because there are more ways a household can be pushed out. And housing that is poorly maintained is also less stable because it may be legally unsafe to live in or a sign of landlord harassment. So this map is showing the combined effect of these four data points, where darker areas have the least stable housing conditions and the lighter areas have more stable housing conditions. Next slide. The last category of risk factors is market pressure. Market pressure refers to neighborhood-wide forces that influence the local market and increasing risk of displacement. Just like the population vulnerability or housing condition categories, it is composed of four data points, change in rents, housing price appreciation, change in population with a four year degree and proximity to neighborhoods experiencing a lot of market pressure. And, and the map on the right shows us the combination of those four factors or darker colored neighborhoods represent pressure, uh, represent higher pressure relative to the rest of the city and the lighter colored areas have relatively lower market pressure. Next slide. 
Again, the displacement risk index is a component of the overall data tool. This is the landing page of the draft website Sarit walked us through earlier. You can see the highlighted data tool button. This is how Sarit was navigating to the data tables. But if you click displacement risk, next slide, you can see the map that combines those three categories of risk factors that we just talked about. Just like the other maps we've seen, the darker color represents more displacement risk relative to other New York City neighborhoods. Next slide. Again, all of these draft materials are available online for your, for your review. Over the coming weeks, we'll review your feedback. And on April 1st, we will make public the, the, the website. And more trainings, of course, will be coming in the spring. I'll turn it back over to Sarit. Thank you, Renee. We are now going to shift into the public hearing. If you would like to provide testimony, please use the raised hand function, which is now enabled. You will be called on in the order that you raised your hand. If you are phoning in, press star nine to raise your hand. If you raise your hand and your name is called, you will be promoted to panelist and your Zoom will close and reopen. But don't worry, it will take just a moment while you're promoted. Once you're a panelist, you will be able to use the buttons at the bottom left corner of your Zoom screen. At that point, you can please unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you'd like. When you speak, please begin by introducing yourself. If you logged in using someone else's link, this will give us an opportunity to rename you in Zoom um, with your actual name. We'll now get started with we'll now get started with the hearing testimony. Uh, one first... moment, please. We're just having a minor technical difficulty. My apologies, we can continue. The first three speakers are going to be Paul Epstein, Alex Fennell two, and Alex Fennell five. So we'll start with Paul Epstein. Hello, thank you. I am Paul Epstein, co-chair of Inwood Legal Action and a member of the Racial Impact Study Coalition, the driving force behind Local Law 78. We thank public advocate Williams and Council Land Use Chair Salamanca for their political leadership on this law. As a veteran of past mayor's offices, I know legislative deadlines are not always met, but the professional staff of HPD and DCP have risen to the challenge and are on target to launch the equitable development data tool on time. We thank them for their skill and hard work and for soliciting and responding to our feedback. The EDTT will only be valuable if numerous community stakeholders use it. So in that regard, I actually have an announcement to make here. The Racial Impact Study Coalition will start a project next month with the Center for Urban Pedagogy to develop high quality visual materials to inform and engage participants of grassroots groups across the city about the EDDT. We hope that will accelerate community use and those users will identify revisions to improve the EDDT going forward. I commend HPD and DCP for planning to revise the EDDT this summer, but that will actually will not be enough. It will take much longer than that to engage enough users and for enough racial equity reports to be issued for community members to have sufficient experience using those reports together with the EDDT. So I urge HPD and DCP to make it easy for users to provide feedback, not just in the months after launch, but for years to come and to act on user feedback over the long term to keep improving these tools for community use. Finally, on a technical matter, 
I am a bit concerned that the, all the EDTD data, except for the DRI, will only be provided at the Puma or community district level. But almost all land use actions cover a lot less area than that. That can make the eventual rec racial equity reports drawn from the EDTD less precise and potentially less useful to stakeholders. HPD and DCP have given us reasonable explanations for this geographic choice. However, some indicators are available for smaller geographies. HPD and DCP should examine carefully if future EDT can offer users at least two levels of geography. For example, the main data tables might show all Puma data level data, but the indicators with data available for a smaller geography, such as an NTA, might appear in a different color or change color on hover over to alert users that they can click for more precise data. My instinct is that will make the EDTT and the racial equity reports more useful. I will expand on these remarks in written testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comments and for it's a loud noise. Um, and for continuing to outreach um, and make sure more New Yorkers know about this incredible tool. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is going to be Alex Finelchu. And um, I would also just like to note, uh, as I did not mention up front, that you will have a, a three minute um, time period for your testimony. Is Alex Finnell too ready to provide testimony? Um, I can see that the person who is signed in is Alex Finnell. Um, number two has their microphone turned on. Um, so we should be able to hear them. Sorry, everyone. This is Kelly, Kelly Villar. Uh, I didn't know I was Alex Fennell too. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Kelly Villar. I'm from the uh, Staten Island Urban Center, and we are a community development through community involvement organization uh, seeking to help our borough achieve comprehensive community development planning that includes the voices of local and low income residents of Staten Island's urban neighborhoods. Uh, we're thankful to the city for the development of this tool. In our view, it will be a valuable resource as we advocate for better and affordable housing, uh, public assets and access to resources. We are thankful to the public advocate Jamani Williams and his office for their efforts that did not stop even through the pandemic to get the job done. We're grateful for land use chair, council member Rafael Salamanca and his committee leadership uh, on this and even Staten Island's own council member Borelli for his vote of yes <laughs> for local law 78. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the racial impact study coalition for their tireless effort of which we are proud to be a core member and have found much in common with many communities around the city and have built partnership and camaraderie with several groups as a result. We're enthused by the rollout of the equitable development data tool and realize that it's a unique opportunity for our city and hopefully will set the example for our state and country. Uh, we wanna cheer on HPD and DCP and their outreach and encourage them to widely publicize this tool invest in educating communities, how to use it and ensure community board civic groups and advocacy organizations are understanding uh, the way it should be used. We all grew up with the sayings, a picture is worth a thousand words and knowledge is power. This tool has the ability to directly respond to equity and development. It has facts and figures that can educate, illuminate and provide the visual bandwidth 
of urban planning and its effects on communities of color and low-income neighborhoods. However, a picture only has value when people see it, and knowledge is only power is only power when we use it. Uh, New York urbanist Jane Jacobs once said, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they were created by everybody. We believe Local Law 78 of 2021 represents the beginning of this process coming to fruition. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, your comment and support of the tool. So our next speaker is going to be Alex Fennell Five. And we'll note that if you see your Zoom um, popping in and out, that means that you are the next speaker if you're not aware of how you're named in Zoom right now. Hello? Hello, yes, we can hear you. Okay, all right, I didn't hear anything. Hi, my name is Cheryl Pam and I'm a resident of Inwood and a co-chair of Inwood Legal Action, which is a member of the Racial Impact Study Coalition, which pushed for the enactment of Local Law 78. I'd like to thank public advocate Jumani Williams and Land Use Chair Rafael Salamanca and the staff of HPD and DCP for the implementation of this law. Um, I'm going to make just one comment and then submit more detailed comments in writing. Um, the comment I'd like to make is about the need for reliability data. Data that are great and labeled unreliable by HPD and DCP could lead to people deciding not to use the data. Any great data must be clearly contextualized with an explanation to avoid misinterpretation or misuse by the public. I ask that reliability be to reflect the range of interpretations that exist among expert practitioners and that margins of error and confidence intervals be presented in addition to the coefficient of variation so that data users can make their own determination about reliability quickly. It would be a misuse of the data if a developer submitted a racial equity report lacking analysis that is critical to communities simply because HBD and DCP deemed EDDT data to be unreliable. It would be a misinterpretation of the meaning of reliability if community groups opted not to use data in their efforts to participate in the public review of a rezoning because they decided that they could not use grayed out data deemed unreliable by HPD and DCP. The public cannot use EDT, EDDT data responsibly if it is not given the information that it needs to do so. And so that is what I'm asking of HPD and DCP. The second comment is about the displacement risk index, which is a very important metric to communities and a novel metric for use by official policymakers. So I'm hoping that HPD and DCP P can be flexible and plan a future date years out to consider revisions to the metric, even if it's not required by law. Even though the displacement risk index is not intended to predict displacement, I would hope that HPD and DCP would want the metric to be meaningful and effective and would be willing to evaluate how well the DRI actually measured risk of displacement for different groups and whether the DRI effectively measured displacement risk at all. Uh, I will submit more detailed comments in writing, but thank you all so very much for all of your work on this. And thank you so much for your testimony. So the next speaker is going to be uh, the person signed in is Alex Fennell Four, um, and as I mentioned up front, if you are asked to rejoin as a panelist, that means that you have been promoted to speak next. Hi. I'm actually Alex Fennell. Um, so, um, um, hi, so my name's Alex Fennell. I'm the senior political organizer at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. Uh, we're a member organization whose mission is to build community power to win affordable housing and thriving equitable neighbors for all New Yorkers. We're also a proud member of the Racial Impact Study Coalition. 
Uh, the Equitable Development Data Tool is a direct outcome of the coalition's years-long grassroots activism, consensus building, and technical support in drafting in order to pass Local Law 78 of 2021. Uh, it also took the work of crucial partners, particularly the public advocate Jumani Williams and council member Rafael Salamanca Jr. ANHD also commends the work of HPD and DCP in honoring the spirit of the legislation and working to deliver this tool on time and the agency's openness in working closely with us, the coalition, and the public in general to make it stronger. Local Law 78 of 2021 and the EDDT that it requires is an historic first in the nation race positive land use reform. For the first time, the city acknowledges that inequalities of race, income and ethnicity uh, for residents and small business owners can be exacerbated by proposed land use actions and provides the data communities need to understand who's being served by a proposal and whether it works to advance community equity in their neighborhoods and citywide. This makes it all the more crucial that we ensure the data in the EDDT is not being presented in a way that obscures smaller geographies and populations or allows neighborhoods of color to be hidden within larger community district demographics. We would encourage the agencies to consider providing data tables at smaller geographies than the community district, especially if this, this is feedback they hear from communities once the tool is officially released and racial equity port reports are begin to be required for certain ULERP applications. We appreciate the agency's transparency around the development of the EDDT thus far, and would urge them to continue soliciting and incorporating broad community feedback over time in the development, implementation, and as crucially, revision of the EDDT and the DRI. Lastly, we would encourage city agencies to work to incorporate the data provided by the EDDT into their larger land use decision-making process. This data should be used to inform our city government's entire approach to land use and planning. ANHD has long been an advocate for a more comprehensive planning approach for, it, for New York City, one that is fundamentally centered on advancing racial and economic equity and the information provided by the EDDT is a crucial step in moving us towards that path. And we look forward to working together to make that a reality. Thank you for your testimony, Alex. So the next speaker is going to be the person signed in as Alex Vanell one And again, if you're not aware of how you are named, um, if you, your Zoom uh, will promote you to panelists, that means that you are the next speaker. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tara Duvivier, and I am senior planner at Pratt Center for Community Development. Pratt Center works for a more just, equitable, and sustainable New York City in partnership with community-based groups, small businesses, and the public sector. We are also a member of the Racial Impact Study Coalition. To start, I wanna thank HPD and DCP for working so hard to deliver the equitable development data tool on time, working with us to answer any questions and incorporate feedback, and beginning to introduce the tool to the larger community. This legislation was hard fought victory that will finally require the city to examine what we already know, that many of the land use actions in New York City have negative impacts on residents and small business owners, particularly in communities of color. In 2020, both of your agencies made pledges to address racial in and income disparities in policy and local law 78 of 2021 is a good first step. I wanna thank public advocate Jumani Williams for being our principal sponsor, as well as council land use member Rafael Salamanca for also being a prime sponsor of the legislation. The EDDT will help communities visualize and understand impacts of proposed development in their community and advocate more effectively to ensure land use actions in their communities, encourage economic stability for all residents. Many past land use actions have resulted in rapidly increasing rents, resulting in displacement of residents and local businesses, which have destabilizing effects. At this point in time, it's crucial that there be widespread awareness and outreach for the tool with trainings and info sessions to educate community boards, organizations, and the public at large on how to use the tool. The tool must also be made more accessible with language translations other than Spanish and acknowledgement of the many languages spoken in our communities. 
We appreciate HPD and DCP's transparency and willingness to communicate with the public on the development of the EDDT. And we want to assist with these agencies in this work and to ensure that the tool is implemented and revised to address the needs of our communities. We urge HPD and DCP to continue to listen to communities and take their input into account in building a tool that works for the people who are most affected by development. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. At this point, we do not have other speakers signed up. I would encourage you to raise your hand if you are interested in providing testimony today. We'll do, we'll wait um, 10 minutes. We'll do a 10 minute recess as we wait um, for more speakers to sign up. It's uh, for one moment. Uh, okay. We have one more uh, Alex Fennell uh, raising their hand. Uh, <clears throat> hello. Um, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Moses Gates. I'm Vice President uh, for Housing and Neighborhood Planning at Regional Plan Association. Um, we would we have also been a member of the, the Racial Impact Coalition and would just like to say that this process, we would like to thank HPD, DCP, all the other city agencies involved, as well as all of our partners in the coalition, and you know, feel that this is really an exam, as well as you know, I should say the electeds involved, uh, especially uh, Public Advocate Williams. This is an example of how, when elected officials, uh, city agency staff, and uh, uh, civic organizations partner uh, in a collaborative way, things can really move, and really good things can happen for the city. Um, on a technical level, us here at RPA, we have done some of our own analysis concerning the displacement risk and have found that displacement risk is, is heavily, heavily predicated on uh, vulnerable populations, specifically low-income renters in, in non-rent protected housing, meaning uh, not public housing, not Section 8, not rent regulated housing, um, and encourage any data tool that is developed to really reflect that population vulnerability in terms of uh, any kind of displacement index. Uh, we also encourage the, uh, the administration to make this as simple and digestible as possible in terms of a tool um, so that not only is data out there and that but people can understand the data and understand how the, these uh, were arrived at in a, in a clear manner and even uh, adjust, uh, uh, have the capacity to kind of adjust those inputs um, to see various other scenarios that they might have. Uh, the next step in this process is obviously community engagement. Um, we would encourage uh, the administration to really uh, uh, put heavy resources into this, um, and including uh, language translation and languages other than Spanish, and uh, to gather feedback uh, from not only people, not only geographies that currently have uh, a heavy population vulnerability, but also to do outreach to people um, who may not be living in those geographies or may not even be living in New York City, um, but have in the past experienced displacement pressures and displacement themselves. Um, finally, we commend the administration for looking back at evictions as an indicator to try to get to uh, displacement vulnerability, but also want to encourage the administration to see if there's a way to look at not just concrete effect, martial affected evictions, but also softer evictions that not go that far where people are pressured out with displacement in order to form the analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. So at this point, as we wait for more speakers, we will take 10 minutes um, to allow other speakers to join the meeting and register to speak.
and while we wait, just want to thank all the attendees and participants. Um, you know, many of you have been involved in this process for a long time, and so really appreciate your involvement in this effort. And it's great to see everyone.
Hi, everyone. Uh, we have come back from our recess, and at this time, we do not have any other speakers who have signed up to give comment. So at this time, we are concluding this public hearing. We want to say again, thank you for your comments, for those who participated, for the tremendous amount of work done by the communities and the nonprofits and the coalition uh, in getting to this point. We again want to thank the leadership of public advocate Jamani Williams, the leadership of Land Use Committee Chair Salamanca for their uh, for their work on this bill. And we welcome more comments and testimony from the public. So please submit those comments to us. Uh, you have until March 20th. And we are excited for this tool to launch on April 1st. Thank you again for uh, participating this evening. And we hope to hear more from you and others in the weeks and months ahead.